In the last video, we proved that xi n and xi m are mutually orthogonal, provided that n is not equal to m. And I promise you that this property will come in useful later on, and that is what I will try to show you now. So now I'm going to focus on a special property of the stationary states. So recall in the previous video, we've essentially found the set of solutions to the time independent Schrodinger equation. So we found the solutions xi 1x, xi 2x, xi 3x, and so on. So each one of these functions, they are all solutions to the time independent Schrodinger equation. Now they have a special property in that this set of functions, they are complete. And what that means is that any function f of x, so this function could be anything, it could be x, it could be x squared, it could be x to the power of 3 minus x. So any function can be expressed as a linear combination of these uh, xi functions. And the reason why this is true is because of Fourier series. So if you just break apart this xi term over here, you see that this is just equal to this expression over here. So you see that we're essentially we're just doing Fourier series. And Fourier series, uh, there are theorems that tells us that uh, these functions are complete. So the set of all these sine functions, they are complete so that any linear combination of them can give us a function that we want. So uh, in order to, so if I'm given a function, let's say x to the power of 3 minus x, I can establish this equality by tweaking these constants over here. So you see that what we're doing essentially is just we're taking c1, multiplying it by xi1, you take c2, multiply it by xi2, take c3, multiply it by xi3, and then we add them up. So this is what this summation term over here means. And as we tweak these constants over here, xi1, uh, c1, c2, and c3, we can uh, manage to make this whole expression here be equal to this left-hand side function. Well, in this case, it's just x to the power of 3 minus x. And this is actually a very special and useful property. And before I explain why this property is useful, let's focus on how we can find this constant cn. So we know that we can estab establish this equality by tweaking cn. But if we're given a function, let's say in this case, once again, x to the power of 3 minus x, how do we know how we should tweak cn so that the left-hand side is re equal to the right-hand side? So we can do this by using what we proved in the previous video. So let's start with this line over here. So we know that this is true for certain cn. So if we tweak this in a certain way, some any function f of x is equal to this right-hand side expression over here. But we just don't know how to tweak cn. And then we can find cn by multiplying both sides by xi m of x, so m is just a uh, dummy constant, you could, can, it could be anything. And then we're going to integrate both sides from 0 to a. So on the left hand side, we're also going to multiply it by xi m of x, and then take the integral. So on the left hand side, we can just pull out the constants, so essentially the whole thing becomes something like this. So xi m x, xi m x, dx. So what this means essentially is that we have c1 times the integral xi 1x times xi m of x dx plus c2 xi 2 of x xi m x dx and so on. I think you get the idea. xi 3, uh, c3 xi 3, xi m x dx and so on. This goes on to infinity. Now, as you can see from the previous video, if n is not equal to m, then this integral is equal to 0. Well, in this case, that means, well, I'm assuming m is not equal to 1. This is equal to 0, this is equal to 0, this is equal to 0. And then if you check out the entire uh, infinite series over here, you see that only one term remains. So let's just copy down what we have so far. So on the left-hand side, we have this integral over here. And on the right-hand side, we had this infinite series, and we showed that most of these terms, they're just going to disappear because xi1 and xi m, xi2 and xi m, they're all orthogonal. And only one term will survive, and that is the term, the mth term. So we have 0 to a xi m x times xi m of x. And if you recall from the previous video, this integral will not go to 0, and it's actually going to be equal to 1. And so you see that cm is equal to this integral over here. So actually we have found a formula for cm. And m is really just a dummy variable. We can change it back to n. So what this means is that we found a formula to find what the constant should be. So this is the formula.
So what this means is that if I'm given a constant, uh, if I'm given a fun function, let's say x to the power of 3 minus x, I, I could use this expression uh, and I can tweak these constants cn so that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. And then the formula for cn is given by this expression over here. So this, uh, so all this mathematics over here, all, all of this is very fancy. So how is this going to be useful? And this is going to be useful because we can actually use this to construct our solution for the wave function. So recall that the, so let's go back to the physics. So recall that the wave function, it is equal to xi of x times this e term over here. So this is the x component, this is the time component. And recall that we found a whole set of solutions to the time independence coding equation. So we found that uh, we have all these possibilities, xi1, xi2, and xi3. So that means we don't uh, we have many different solutions to the uh, for the, for the wave function. So I'm going to label this with a subscript n, and this is going to correspond to xi n of x. And then here I'm going to also have to put a subscript for the energy e. So if you recall from the previous videos, we found an expression for the energy level. So this is going to be e n. So this is formula in terms of n. So you see that our wave function, we actually have a whole bunch of different combinations as well. And due to the nature of the Schrodinger equation, the linear combination of all these uh, possibilities, it is also a solution to the Schrodinger equation. So now I'm taking the linear combination of all these wave functions. So this entire expression itself is also a valid wave function. So if I just expand this term over here, I'm going to put these expressions down. So you see that this expression, this is actually the most general expression for the wave function. So this is also a solution to the wave function. And recall that in your classical mechanics, we're actually always doing something similar. So we have maybe a situation and we have a particle that's bouncing around. And then we come up with these equations of motion on uh, on the position of the particle. And then we also always have to use these initial conditions, like the initial velocity and the initial position to kind of narrow down our solutions so that we get a, a formula that describes the, uh, the position of our particle. And then we're actually doing the same thing in quantum mechanics, in, except that instead of an equation of motion, we're actually dealing with a wave function. So that means we also have to deal with initial conditions. So right now you see that this wave function, it has this general formula, this general solution over here. But then, uh, much like in classical mechanics, we can narrow it, narrow down our answer by finding what this CN should be, by setting an initial condition. And the way we do that is that we set, we define the initial wave function when time is equal to zero. So you can imagine you have your xi x of zero, and it's going to look like uh, it's going to be some function. So you can set this to whatever you want. And then as time goes on, this function is going to evolve, it's going to change. But then, oh, I don't care how it evolves, all I care now is that we are given, we're going to set an initial condition for the function. So you see that this is pretty much like how we set our initial condition for our cases in class mecha classical mechanics, like how we set the initial position and the initial velocity. So this is pretty much the same thing, only now we're dealing with a wave function. So uh, we can narrow down these CNs over here uh, by setting the initial wave function. And you see that if we substitute t equal to 0, this e term over here is going to be equal to 1. So just like e to the power of 0. So it's just equal to 1. So on the right hand side, you see that we have something like this. And as you can see, this looks oddly familiar because this is exactly what we had before. This is our statement we had when we were showing you that the xi ends, they, are, they form a complete set of functions. So what this means is that if we set this initial wave function, we can always find cn by doing what we did over here, by doing this integral over here. So if we just take the integral from 0 to a, we take the initial wave function and then multiply it by xi n of x and dx, we can use this formula to find cn. 
and then we can plug it back into our uh, complete to our most general form of the wave function. So we can substitute it back into this formula over here. And we can obtain our wave function. So this is the formula on how we can find the uh, constant Cn based on this initial wave function. And then after we found Cn, we can plug it into this uh, formula over here and plug it into this part over here. And this would be our complete answer to the Skorinovir equation. This wave function would be our answer. And uh, all this sounds really abstract, so later on we're going to move on to a concrete example to see how all these would work out in a real example.